one of the questions that we're always asking ourselves is how can we continue to grow our practice, grow our business, become more profitable, and ultimately have a business that is successful and, and working for us? And that's what we're going to talk about today with my guest, uh, Liz Lord, who is the owner of Liz Lord Coaching uh, and Consulting. She works with dental practices and is doing some really great things out there. I was connected with Liz through uh, the Facebook world, like many of us get connected through these days in 2023. And uh, I'm really excited to have her on here and help our audience uh, become more profitable in their practices. So Liz, thank you for joining us and would love to hear a little bit about what has led you to the path of this crazy world of dentistry that we live in? Oh, well, first of all, thank you, Shane, for having me. I'm really grateful to be here today. I I think I've always been in dentistry. I mean, I was literally barely out of high school when I started in dentistry. Um, and I started as a clinical person. I had tried healthcare, a uh, little too impersonal, found dentistry, and it just clicked. And, um, and I spent a dozen years being clinical. And then I went into the business side of dentistry, studied business, and I've been coaching dental practices now for 20 years. And uh, hard to believe that number. But uh, it's, it's the sort of thing where, you know, to me, dentistry is really just a noble profession. You get to combine artistry, healthcare and people skills all together. And it's really all about taking great care of your patients. And when you do that, then the results show up. Um, and a lot of times dentists come to me because they love the clinical part and they <laughs> if they could only focus on that, that would be great. But then they buy this practice and their cl clinical excellence is only about one third of their job now. And they're not really trained how to lead and manage people or how to grow a business. And so they come to me in, usually in a lot of pain because of it, when you're not trained to do something and it's a major part of your job, it, you struggle with it, right? And, and so, you know, I, I've been a student of human behavior for 20 plus years and, you know, been a student of dentistry for about the same amount of time. So it, and, and business and the business of dentistry. So it was really just a, a perfect blend, maybe a perfect storm that brought me to this point. And you mentioned, you know, your experience in dentistry. What are some of the changes that you've seen, you know, over the past couple of decades in doing this where, you know, things have changed? Maybe it's for the better in dentistry, but maybe what are some things that have changed that have become more challenging for the practice mm. owner? Yeah, you know, there's a lot that's changed for the better, especially, you know, having my clinical background and just loving clinical dentistry in, in the realm of clinical dentistry. The, the advances that have happened over the last three decades, uh, but the last two decades are just extraordinary with technology and, and you know, technology's ability to, to streamline dentistry and make it fun and exciting. And, and of course, we have a whole generation now of very tech-savvy dentists. But some of the things that have changed maybe in the other direction in dentistry um, really hits those pain areas I was talking about, um, dealing with, with staff is a whole new realm now. We have a different generation of, of workers out there who have different expectations. And, you know, most people aren't staying in a job more than four years now. And that's certainly a big change from, from you know, a few decades back. Um, and, and just their expectations and how to meet those. And then also in the business side of dentistry, insurance has had such a huge impact in dentistry in the last decade, especially and, and certainly not for the better. It's, it's causing a lot of problems and a lot of pain, not just for, for practices, but for patients too. And, and so, you know, the, the direction that, that the insurance industry is moving in dentistry is certainly not helping the private practitioners uh, to be able to be successful. So there's, there's a lot of new struggles out there, as well as some pretty awesome new techno technological advances. Yeah, I was just the other day, uh, you know, as many people know, I'm, I'm based in Indianapolis and I was at the uh, Midwest Dental Assembly and I got to see for the very first time one of those robots that places implants. And I was just like, whoa, you know, just blown away by this thing. I've read articles and things, but it was just like, uh, man, how it has evolved over the years. And, you know, maybe that's part of where some practices go in the future to try to become more profitable is 
you know, having you know, robots and things like this, it's kind of sci-fi like to even think about it, but let's start more in the present and the now, because obviously that's something that's, uh, you know, maybe not realistic for a lot of practice owners. Really what I talk to people, um, they say, you know, with the insurances and kind of really squeezing their profitability, there's a few different paths they feel like they can go, you know, either they go out a network and, and go, you know, full fee for service, or maybe they try to negotiate rates. But when we were talking before we started recording, you had mentioned about adding maybe some different services uh, to the practice. Talk a little bit about that, because I thought that was really um, some good insight. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of offices, they think, you know, when it comes to insurance, that's all they have. They have an A or a B. I can go out of network or I can try to make it work in network. Um, and and it's not black and white like that. There's definitely hybrids. To, to see what works, what doesn't work, and really build a formula for your practice that works. And one of the things that works really well is to bring in services that are high value services, but are outside of the realm of insurance. Um, and a lot of doctors, you know, they look to, to different things. There's a big push right now in sleep dentistry uh, for, for those very reasons. Now it does kind of branch into the medical world and, and that's great. There's more and more service providers that can help with that. And certainly I'm part of um, an organization that can help with that as well. But um, I'm really excited about the opportunity that exists in TMD because the TMD world also pulls the sleep world into it. Um, because ultimately when, when there's a, a sleep problem, quite often it's because there's a TMD problem going on. And so when you just ad address the sleep, you're, you're not getting the, the full spectrum. And what I really love about um, the opportunities that exist in, in the TMD realm is that it's so prevalent in dentistry and it's been so misunderstood for, for such a long time. I, I know when I started in dentistry that, you know, when we, whenever we had a patient come in that had jaw pain and, and you know, we knew that the, it was a TMJ problem, the consensus has been like, don't go there. You just can't help them. You're never going to be successful. It's going to be painful for you and the patient, and, and it's just not worth even attempting. And um, fortunately, I've, I've had the benefit of, of working with some practitioners who've done a ton of research in this area and, and gotten so much training and put together um, just a phenomenal program to be able to, to show dentists that the prevalence of, of TMJ problems is about as prevalent as periodontal problems. Um, and, and we know that 75% of the population has some form of periodontal disease and, and TMD is right up there with it. Now you don't treat 100% of, of periodontal disease the same way because you've got advanced and you've got early. Same thing with TMD. Some things need training, some don't. But you're entering into a realm where patients are driven, patients who are getting treatment are driven because they have symptoms and pain. Um, and even if they don't have pain, they could have symptoms like, you know, tinnitus, ringing in their ears, ear congestion, um, vertigo, those sorts of things that they've talked to their doctors over and over about and they can't get any resolution to because it's really the dentist who is who has the scope of practice because oral appliance therapy is the therapy for that. And that's something that's highly profitable and not in the insurance world for the most part. So these are things that you can find existing within your practice today if you just know the right questions to start asking your patients. And patients are much more motivated to do something about that because it's tied to other symptoms that they're having. And it's not just, hey, you need a night guard because you're grinding your teeth or, or you're going to break your teeth, which is not a today problem. But when, you, when you're able to identify that this is actually part of other problems that they are experiencing today and they would love to be rid of, all of a sudden the motivation to take action and, and move forward with treatment is right there. You don't even have to, to really enroll them in it. And so it becomes a highly profitable center for the practice um, and you're treating your patients at such a higher level um, and, and you really differentiate yourself in your community as well because it's, it's not well understood and and not prevalent out there. So there are very limited places that patients can go to get the care. So it serves multiple things. You stand apart in your marketplace. You have a high profit center within your practice with, with a patient base 
that's right there and you can market out to other uh, healthcare professionals and, and people want it. So it's, it's one of my favorite things to do because when you've taken something really complicated and simplified it for the doctors and made it highly profitable and it's desirable by patients, that's just a win-win-win to me. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen this with some of your offices that have implemented that, but I know just one off the top of my head we have in the, uh, the Denver area and they literally have people come to them from out of state for this treatment. And they've really, like you said, it's differentiated themselves, made them very profitable and think about, you know, from, if I put our marketing hat on here, um, Think about you know the the patient reviews and testimonials you can get when something like this has been bothering them for likely years that maybe they haven't had answers to, and then they you know share how you have helped them. It's it's treating. We have a saying: treating beyond the teeth, and that's really what it is. It is. It's you're treating orofacial pain is what it is, and there's you know a lot of times these patients like they're migraine sufferers or or people who have more than a couple headaches a week. They would love to be rid of these symptoms. They will travel, as you said, out of state as far as they have to go because they can't get resolution anywhere else. And, you know, the great news is, is that you've got about a 95% success rate with these patients. There's a small percentage where there's something else going on and, and you know, you're, you're referring them to neurologists or whomever is the most appropriate to deal with that. But most of the time, it's, it's a misalignment of the, the mandible um, to their skull. And a lot of times it's a retrusion. It's just it's further back than it should be, which is what contributes to the sleep problem and the snoring and things like that. But it also creates pain or it creates other symptoms, you know, ear symptoms, vertigo and, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, I mean, it's a differentiator for sure. And people want it. You don't even have to try to enroll them. If, and, and, you know, what I love is you can take it in a step-by-step approach. So it's not like you have to, to, to fully jump into everything. It's like you can diagnose it and you can try a temporary step, which will confirm your diagnosis and then get them into appliance therapy from there. So there's, you know, there's a lot of checks and balances to make it um, a little more uh, easy for the dentist to say, okay, I, I, can, I can go there and I can learn this because they're not taught this in dental school. Um, and, and it is the sort of thing where it, if you think about it, when you're doing restorative dentistry, you want to restore to an occlusion that, that works for the patient, not one that's actually creating pain because it's the teeth that are holding the jaw in the wrong position and not allowing it to go into the right position. So when you correct what's happening and causing the pain, which is, which is a soft tissue problem, it's you know muscular pain and things like that, when you correct that alignment, then you can then do restorative dentistry so that the teeth hold that alignment going forward. Uh, So it's, it's incredibly profitable as well. And patients are so motivated, whether it's, whether they just simply do oral appliance therapy or you go all the way through to reconstructive in one form, form or fashion or another. How long, how long does it typically, you know, take for somebody to get started on that, you know, with the training and everything. Um, obviously, it's probably, you know, a, a lifelong thing that people probably really get passionate about and continue to take courses on in advance with. But what have you seen as kind of like the timeline for the, the entryway to, to get into something like that? Well, what's really fascinating is, you know, you can prove it to yourself before you even get there. Um, I'm part of a, a study club with a partner of mine that we do um, every week on TMD. And one of the things we'll do is we'll just teach doctors the questions to ask your patient. When you see a patient that you would normally recommend a night guard for, just asking them a half a dozen additional questions will help you identify, is the night guard the most appropriate treatment, or is this somebody who's really got a TMD issue? Uh, we actually had one doctor on our podcast who, who took that back to his practice, and he's like, oh my gosh, I just identified three people today that, have, that, that need this. Wow. And so then you know, they can just take the first level training, which will teach them how to get somebody out of pain with oral appliance therapy. And that's, that's a a couple days of training right there. Um, And just bring it right back into your practice. And one of the things that the reason the doctor I I work with partners with me is because, you know, so many times we've seen doctors 
go get some new piece of equipment or, you know, um, the CEREC was a big thing, especially when it first came out. They'd go get trained. They were super excited, but they couldn't get it integrated into their practice. And so it became a really expensive dust collector. And so, you know, my role, aside from being somebody I've, you know, I've, I've been working with clients who deal with this for about a dozen years or more now. Um, but my role is really how do you get it implemented into the practice with your team, with billing, with all the different uh, areas that need to, to be able to handle this so that it's, you know, not just clinically I can, I can say, yeah, here's the person. It's, this is a, a system that now works and it serves our patients well and it serves the practice well. So it's really, you know, it starts with a couple days worth of training and then there's more advanced training from there for the, for the team. There's more advanced training for the doctors um, as they, if they want to take it up past oral appliance therapy and, and that sort of stuff. So overall, you know, if, if they yeah, want to go it. all the way through to, to, you know, reconstructive, look at a few months worth of, of training, five or six months worth of training, but you can't just push it in all at once. Anyhow, they need to take a little bit and go back and use it and then come back for the next. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a very accessible entryway into something like that, that can be so impactful for your patients and for your practice. And for anybody you know listening to this right now, and they're considering implementing something like this, uh, what Liz said there was so important is you know, you have to make sure that yes, you get the shiny you know new toy and you get the uh, that big investment into the practice, but making sure that you have the systems so to support that is absolutely key. And from what I understand, Liz, uh, you help make that happen on the team side to make sure that when you implement a new service um, or offering in the practice, you help make sure that that is integrated fully into the team so that it doesn't bog everybody down. Yeah, you know it's. It's change is hard, and and most people aren't huge fans of change. Some people, you know, like me, we're like, hey, great, something new. But you know, a lot of people are resistant to change, and it's got to make sense. And you know, when when a doctor gets excited about something new, that doesn't mean the doctor knows how to implement it fully into the practice, or has you know the right people in place, or or the right systems. And so that is such a key role. And I've, I've been coaching dental practices now for 20 years in practice management systems and communication and culture. And I can work with the clinical area. I can work with the, the business area uh, because it, you know, you've got your, your different areas and each one has a role to play. Your hygiene department has a role to play. Your, your business office has a role to play. And certainly the doctor's got a key role to play. And knowing the right hand, knowing what the left hand is doing in a dental practice difference between a practice that functions well and is profitable and successful or one that's not functioning so well, not so profitable, spending a lot more money on things than they need to be spending um, because they're basically trying to throw money at problems or, you know, they have more staffing. Their staff do considerably more revenue than they're doing because the, the, the systems are not optimized. So, you know, being able to, to optimize those systems and, and, Make, and always being for protecting profitability because, you know, profitability to a business, money to a business is like oxygen to you and me. We're not living long without it. So we always want to make sure that we're, out, we're looking out for how do we optimize everything so that we get the best results with the, the minimal amount of effort and, and, you know, the patients are thrilled and happy. When you see some of the, the practices that are, you know, they've implemented those systems, they're really just rolling and, and have, you know, some of these uh, new services in that you mentioned, adding that into the practice as well. I know this is different for every owner and, and where they're at. So, and I always tell people not to try not to compare yourself to others. But what have you seen as like a really good, healthy profit margin overall for a, a practice um, that's really you know, firing on all cylinders. Well, you know, there are a lot of variables. Is this the solo doctor practice? Is this a practice with associates in it? Associates are always going to add about 10, 11% to your overhead costs. Um, and, and that's okay, you know. Um, but typically, I like... For your see, sanity. <laughs> it is, you know, well, and, and you're going to max out yeah. one doctor. And if you want to care for as many patients as you have, you need the, the appropriate amount of hands to do that. Um and but when it comes to like if you're taking just a, a single practice that's in a mature state, it's not a startup practice. It's, you know, they, they're kind of running on all cylinders at this point. Um, 
four days a week, that sort of thing. I typically like to coach a practice to be at 65% or below. I've had practices where they were below 50% overhead. Um, and, you know, it, it really depends on many factors. It's very doable. But, you know, there's a range of what's healthy for a practice. And you always kind of look at your staff overhead as your number one ex- variable expense. There's only five variable expenses in a dental practice. Everything else is fixed. But if you can control your five variables, you know, staffing being your number one expense and your number one variable, and that's typically going to have, you know, about 20 to 25 percent, but that can vary from 15 to about 30, depending on the practice. But typically 20 to 25 percent for most practices is the healthy zone to be in. Um, You manage that as your number one expense. You can get your other expenses, you know, to fall in line typically. And like I said, there's only five variables. As long as, you know, you're not paying 20% for your facility or something like that, that's going to, you know, kind of drive your costs right up. Um, but most people aren't, you know. Uh, but but typically, once you're starting to get below 65%, you've opened up a good amount of profitability in the practice. Um, but again, you know, there's ranges. Depends on the, the, the practice. If you've got a lot of associates and things like that, sometimes, you know, 75, 80% is healthy, but your your overall numbers are bigger. So 20% of, of a much larger number is a big number versus 35, 40% of a smaller number. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's perfectly said. And that's a perfect transition too into what we're talking about with um, being the CEO of your dental practice. And I think as business owners in general, we are the doers, right? Like we like to do the thing. And for dentists, they like to be, you know, the ones that are working with their hands and doing the dentistry and and totally understandable. But there comes a point where you hit a, a you know, a peak where you can only do that so much and continue to grow the practice. Um, explain a little bit, Liz, how you've seen, you know, dentists, start to transform into CEOs? What's kind of some of the first steps that when you come into a practice, what are the things that you're looking at to try to assess how they can get to that next level if indeed that's what they're really shooting for? Yeah. You know, when I come into a practice, the one of the, the key things I'm looking for, for for that, you know, how do I help somebody get from having a really expensive job that they've bought themselves to being a business owner? Um, and having a business that thrives. And the key things I'm going to look at, first of all, are the beliefs and the, of the owner and um, the, the leadership that's, that's already there or not there, which may need to be trained. Leadership is, you know, it's not something you're born with. It's something you learn. Um, and it, it's very, very easy, not easy, but it's, it's work, but it's very possible to learn it. Um, and then I look at, the team that's around the doctor because, you know, the doctor is in their, their little cubicle, you know, in their operatory or in their office or wherever they are, they can't have their hands on everything. They have to trust that people are doing what they need to be doing. So um, belief systems drive so much. What do the people surrounding the doctor believe? Do they have the same beliefs and vision that the doctor has? Because, you can train skills all day long, but if somebody doesn't believe in what you believe in, if they don't share your values and they don't have a good attitude, you really don't have anything to work with. So I, I, I look there and then I look at the business. And um, from the business perspective, I look at performance and where is the business performing well and where is the business not performing well or could just elevate their performance to another level and what has to happen. And then, and then, you know, what I do is I map the path from where they are to where they want to go. And I go over that with the doctor and what it's actually going to take for them to get there. You know, are they going to need to, to learn to, to be a better leader, a stronger leader, to make requests of people and, you know, actually step into that role um, or maybe maybe step down a little bit from that role. Some people have, you know, been been through experiences that has them micromanaging and over controlling or overreacting to things that are happening. Um, so, you know, people make, create results and everything we do is through people. So you can have parameters of what a healthy system looks like, 
But you now are bringing that to this organization with this group of people and this philosophy. And so you, you have to blend the two together. It's not about enforcing something on people. It's about finding within these structures and guidelines, where does workability exist for this practice that's aligned with what the doctor is out to create for themselves and for their business and for their lifestyle. My goal is always to have a, a doctor get to a place of practicing by choice. And what choice means is that they, they're there because they want to be there, not because they're chained to that chair and they're never, you know, they're going to die with a handpiece in their hand. Um, I want them at choice so that they're enjoying their career. They're highly profitable. They've got a plan that's going to get them financially to where they, they need to be. They, they understand that plan. They've created that plan. Um, and the, the practice is delivering on fulfilling that plan. And it's, it's not just about taking care of the doctor, but it's about taking care of the doctor who takes care of the team and the team takes care of the patient. And when all of those things are working in harmony, it's a lot of fun practicing dentistry and very profitable. That's, you know, and everybody's happier in that sense. You know, you're, you're going to be happier as the, as the dentist, your team's going to be happier. Uh, your patients are therefore going to get better treatment. Like they're going to be happier. It's really a ripple effect. And one of the things that you said there, Liz, reminds me of this quote that I don't remember where I read it, but it really resonated with me. And it said, a goal without a plan is only a dream. And I, I thought about that and I say, you know what, how many of us as business owners, you know, have this goal in mind, but it's the plan is the hard part. It's planning that out and breaking that down into increments that can then be achieved. And I think that where many of us get stuck is we see the big picture and all there is that we have to do in order mm -hmm. to accomplish that. And it's like that paralysis by analysis, especially with dentists. You know, they're very, you know, uh, perfectionists in many ways, which makes them good at their job. But sometimes these things are messy. You know, you have to start and chunk it up. How do you approach that with your clients to make it not feel so overwhelming for them to start something new? Yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. You know, a lot of times we, we look ahead and we get that deer in the headlights feeling like there's just it's too big. It's I'm too guilty, much. right? Yeah, yeah, of course. You're human. So, of course you are. Um, but the biggest thing is you're going to get 80% of your results from the top 20% of the issues that need to be addressed. So prioritizing and understanding what is the top of the list. You know, what's the cream of the crop here? And what do we need to do to impact that? And, and the top of the list can be many things. It can be where's the biggest thing that's bleeding off the practice that we need to close that down um where's the the biggest upset in the practice the big dis biggest dysfunction um and you know there's just so many ways it's, it's such an individual conversation what's what's the top of the list now i i'll look at it from a business perspective and in business performance i can say hey this area like your hygiene area is going to have a massive impact in your practice so let's go to work on that or your scheduling is, is just not really working for you. Let's go to work on that because that's going to have a, a big impact. But a lot of times it's also, you know, what's meaningful to the doctor and the team that, you know, maybe it's communication is really the biggest part. And the truth is we go to work on all of those things, but, you know, we don't work on everything equally all the time. So it, it's really like where, where are the biggest breakdowns that if we close those down, and we get those areas functioning, it's going to take care of so many of these smaller areas along the way. And, and so that's really, that's the, that's when I'm mapping a practice and, um, from where it is to where it needs to go and map is just an acronym for massive action plan. Right. And when I'm doing that, I'm looking at, you know, what's going to have the, the biggest collateral effect on the practice, not just this one area, but it's going to, you know, this trickle down is going to really just make life so much more <laughs> pleasant for everybody in the practice. And then and then it's all, you know, in a conversation, I'll present my plan. And then with a conversation with the doctor on, on what matters to them. And, and that's where the plan comes into shape. And then we go to work on it and life happens. And, you know, because it's never a straight line from point A to point B. It's, you know, 
sometimes we're going west, sometimes we're going a little north to get west again. Um, and and it's it's dealing with those things that come up along the way. Um, you know, somebody said it's it's more like tacking on a sailboat. You're never just going in a straight line. You're always catching the wind, so you're going back and forth. Um, and and that's really where the coaching comes in because life happens and sometimes life is coming at you like a fastball and and maybe you don't feel you have the skills to just swing away. Like you, you're not big poppy there. You're, you're kind of like little league. Sometimes you're feeling that way. So, yeah. you know, but that's where the coaching really comes in, um, in, in really identifying what's going on, not making it bigger than it needs to be. Cause a lot of times, you know, especially when something is stressful to us, you know, our head just kind of, plays it over and over and over again and we get a lot very anxious about it and it seems so much bigger than it actually is um and and just strategizing okay what's the pathway forward what do we need to do next you know so yes we have this big picture focus but right now what we're working on and dealing with is this and so what needs to happen between now and next week in order to deal with this um and and that's where the coaching is just critical because it keeps our eye on the big picture ball while we're dealing with what's happening in the here and now. Yeah, man, map, massive action plan. I had never heard of that before. And I was like writing it down. I was like, Ooh, I'm going to have to use that. Well, that I can't good, take the so. credit. That's, that's Tony Robbins. So I'll give credit where credit's what, due. And, and I should have known because literally sitting on my desk is a Tony Robbins there book is. that I'm You'll like find reading it and I've there. got like, Two of his other ones in there. So maybe I've read it before and I just never remembered it, but that was good. So I liked, I liked that a lot. Um, okay. So we're wrapping up here. So um, if somebody, you know, I, I'm imagine that there's a lot of people probably going to be listening and they're going to think, man, I, need, I just need to see where my blind spots are. Right. Like I, there's probably, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what is the best way for, you know, people who, you know, want to get in contact with you, Liz, learn a little bit about, more about, you know, maybe how you can help them figure out what those blind spots are in their practice. Um, what's a, a good way to get a hold of you and what do those steps, first steps typically look like? A lot of people reach out to me through email initially, Liz at Liz Lord Coaching. Um, and, you know, we literally just have a conversation the, the first time. Um, it's, and some people reach out to me through Facebook like you did, uh, you know, but, um, you know, I, I think email is really the, the simplest because we all have it everywhere. So Liz at Liz Lord Coaching is, is a great way to say, hey, I just like to, to have a, con a conversation. Um, and, you know, it's typically about 45 minutes. Sometimes it's an hour. I don't really, you know, put a, a clamp on, you know, we only have this so much time because I'm really about service and giving back to dentistry. It's been a, a wonderful profession to me for 35 years now. Um, and if I can make somebody's day a little bit better by having, you know, giving them an extra 20 or 30 minutes on the phone, I'm happy to do that. Um, and, and so it's, it's really just a conversation. And, and for some people, it winds up that we work together. For other people, it winds up that I might make a few recommendations to them because it's just, you know, not where they are. And that's okay, too. Um, you know, I firmly believe when you do the right things, the right things will show up for you. So I'm all about contribution. Um, and so, yeah, Liz at Liz Lord Coaching, you know, go to Liz Lord Coaching dot com. You can go to my LinkedIn profile and my, you know, Facebook. There's so many ways, but um, I think email works best. Perfect. And we'll have that in the show notes, everybody. So um, Liz at Liz Lord Coaching, we'll have all the different links down there. Definitely get a hold of her. Um, great resource of, as you are, you know, to, continuing to grow the practice and see, you know, where some areas of opportunity may be for you. Um, you know, just seeing her work through mutual connections that we have. And uh, that's one of the reasons I have you on the podcast is because I knew that you would be uh, a tremendous value to our audience. Uh, Liz, thank you so much for joining us here today. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we may have to hop back on and, and do this again soon and, and dive even deeper to some of these topics. But I uh, appreciate you sharing your insights. Well, Shane, thank you so much for having me. It's been a wonderful experience and I'm really grateful. Mm -hmm.